Well, Dan, thank you very much for your uh, warm welcome and especially for the privilege of being able to uh, gather in your presence here today and to share a portion of God's word uh, with you. The reason I'm here is because I believe that uh, this particular movement plays a critical role in the national affairs of Australia and uh, I'm glad to support it and to be a participant here today. Uh, just before we begin, uh, may I open in prayer with you. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray this morning as we come before your precious word that that word would be our rule and our guide the Holy Spirit, our teacher, and your greater glory, our supreme concern. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Australian Christian Lobby is a grassroots movement that consists of over 100,000 people who want to bring a Christian influence to all the major spheres of our national life, especially uh, in the areas of business, politics and the social order. The question is, how does one do that in a distinctively Christian way? Uh, fortunately, some who have gone before us have attempted to answer that question and they've left us some very valuable clues. One of them was uh, William Wilberforce, a British parliamentarian in Britain from 1780 until the 1830s and he reflected deeply on these matters. In 1797, after 17 years as a member of the parliament, he wrote what has become a Christian classic on the intersection of the Christian faith with the, uh, the political, economic and social order of a country. It's entitled, A Practical View of Christianity. Actually, that's its abbreviated title, the original one, uh, I suppose in the Puritan tradition, was much longer. Interestingly, its impact was instantaneous. It immediately scandalised the established church and uh, remained one of the best-read books for the next 50 years until around the 1850s. Garth Lean, who is one of Wilberforce's uh, biographers, says of this book... It was read at the same moment by all the leading persons in the nation and sent an instant electric shock throughout English society. It's credited with uh, being a major influence in, the, uh, in, the, in igniting the Second Great Awakening from the 1840s onwards and its influence was felt throughout Europe, uh, throughout the British Empire, especially in Australia at the time of its founding and across the Atlantic to America. So what was its central message? I think it's this. If we want the new life of Christ to transform us and to permeate and influence the society in which we live, it will only happen as Christians give their full attentions to what Wilberforce described as the peculiar doctrines of Christianity. And he named them human corruption, atonement by Christ, salvation by faith alone, new birth by the Holy Spirit. And he said, it is only as Christians preoccupy themselves with these peculiar and core truths that Christ died for our sins, he rose to justify us and sends his spirit to unite us to himself so that our hearts are changed, our minds renewed and our lives transformed, that we will ever be an influence in our culture. It's only as we live in union, he said, with Jesus Christ, the source of all spiritual blessing, that we will produce true fruit, fruit that remains and not simply be the purveyors of moralisms. This, he said, is the only lasting way to genuinely influence a culture. 
And it's for this reason that I want to turn to, with you briefly this morning uh, to this important scriptural principle as Jesus himself enunciates it in John, verses, uh, John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Let me read them to you. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now you'll notice in the central figure of speech that Jesus employs in this text that he refers to himself as the true vine and his disciples are the branches. It's obvious what his intention is. Uh, he wants us to understand and be reminded of the fact of this crucial doctrine of the union of believers with himself. It's not only a legal union or a covenantal union, it is also a vital union. And it's only as we live in this vital union with Christ that we have any hope of producing true, lasting fruit that will actually have a transformative effect not only on our lives but the lives of other people who we touch that's why this passage, in a sense, is so significant for a Christian movement such as ours, uh, which has come to consider how we influence the culture in which we live. It speaks directly to the challenge that confronts us. How do we go about our work? Now, in this metaphor of Jesus as the vine, the main focus of his attention is on the vine's branches. Some of the branches bear fruit and others do not. Both sorts of branch appear to be connected to the vine, but there is only one sort of branch that bears fruit. The branch without fruit is lifeless and is not connected to the vine. It appears to be, but it never produces anything. In the context of the upper room discourse where this speech takes place. Jesus has in mind a man who has just exited the room because he's shown himself to have no lasting fruit in his life. And I'm referring to Judas. So as Jesus explains this teaching about himself as the true vine and his disciples as the branches, he's warning that it's very common for people to associate themselves with him, but not to be his followers. They have the appearance of life, but in fact, they're dead. And since that was true of Ju Judas, uh, Jesus instructs his disciples with the memory of Judas leaving the Last Supper, with that uppermost in their minds. I think he's pleading with each one of us as disciples. Make sure you are a true branch. Now notice that both of these branches appear to stand in close 
relationship to Christ. Judas was appointed to a very important administrative role amongst the ten. He was regarded as one of the most trustworthy of the disciples. And the lesson, I think, for us is that not everyone who believes in Christ is actually a follower. Uh, We read in the Gospels that while there were many people who were interested in associating with Jesus, uh, not everyone was a disciple who was prepared to carry his cross. In other words, I think we've got a reminder here that Jesus is saying, it's one thing to be a church member. It's another thing to be a true disciple and to have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the call of Christ is a call to union with him with respect to his life and his mission. And he's reminding us that it is far more than just a decision or praying a sinner's prayer. Now notice that the distinguishing mark of a true branch is that it actually draws life from the vine and a dead branch does not. But it's even more than that. The true branch actually bears fruit. It produces fruit. Fruit is the sign of its life. Now, lest you think that I'm about to sneak in the doctrine of good works here uh, through the back door, uh, I I don't want to dismay you. Uh, That's not happening. But rather, what he is saying is that this fruit is the direct result of being grafted into Christ. We don't produce the fruit of ourselves. It's something that happens to us as a result of being united with him. As Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're given new life in Christ Jesus. Why? To do good works, which God himself prepared for us beforehand to walk in. Elsewhere he said, every good tree produces good fruit. You shall know them by their fruits. That's why Calvin famously said, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. It's always accompanied by fruit. There will always be fruit in the life of a person who's in living union with Christ. Did you realise that 24 out of the 27 books of the New Testament have got specific references to this doctrine of spiritual fruit? Every one of Paul's letters mentions it. It's an Old Old Testament concept as well. The blessed man in Psalm 1 is described as a tree planted by streams of waters which yields its fruit in season. So the idea of spiritual fruit is found everywhere in the Bible and it's the outcome of a life that is renewed by the grace of God and spent in vital union with Christ. Good works are not things that we generate ourselves. They take place within us because we've been born anew by the Spirit of God and we have been saved for this very purpose to engage in them. Now, fruit can mean a number of different things in Scripture. It can, for example, uh, refer to the virtues of a Christ-like character. Christ-likeness is the first fruit of personal union with Christ. It comes about through the work of the Spirit within us, who begins to replicate the image of God within every believer. It comes uh, through the Spirit who purges our lives from the works of the flesh and replaces them with spiritual characteristics. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control. And as a believer remains in union with Christ and is renewed by the Holy Spirit, The Spirit develops these virtues in our life. But there are other kinds of fruit as well. 
One of them is thoughtful, edifying, and useful communication. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul mentions some communication that, though well-intended, does not help other believers. So it's got to be communication which is clarifying, profitable, and encouraging, especially about the things of God. If a movement such as this is to be life-transforming, and influential in our culture, we need to be people who embody these very virtues and who relate to our wider society with words that people uh, remark upon, just as they did of Jesus, when people wondered at the gracious words which came from his mouth. Notice also the fruit consists of good works. The Apostle Paul says to the Colossians, live a life worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work. Remember, that was the mark of the master. Peter, when he was preaching to Cornelius, said this, you know how God anointed him, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good because God was with him. Is that a mark of the movement? Is it a fruit that's observed by virtue of our union with Christ? Now let me conclude by reminding you how all this takes place. Paul tells us in verse... uh, Jesus tells us in verse 3, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine and then in verse 7 if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it will be given you i simply want to conclude by reminding you of the importance of the centrality of the word of god in our lives this is the secret of the transformation It's no surprise that William Wilberforce was a man of the word. To read his book, A Practical View of Christianity, demonstrates just how deeply he read scripture and the extent to which it shaped his thoughts and especially his spiritual affections. Wilberforce knew in a way that very few others did that it was only the transformative power of the word of God in the lives of Christians and in the lives of others that they touched, that would actually make those momentous changes and transitions in society for which we long and pray. The word is the thing that purifies us. The word is the thing that not only transforms our minds but changes our habits and indeed the behaviour of a family and a nation. It's no surprise that Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. It seems to me that if we as an organisation wish to continue uh, our influence in the wider culture, we need to uh, have this watchword that was the watchword that was given to Joshua, as he began his great mission. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Then you will be prosperous and enjoy good success. Uh, My prayer for us as a gathering today and as part of a wider movement uh, is that we will be salt and light in our community, uh, largely because of our knowledge and our obedience to God's word. Thank you.